Welcome to another edition of The Coach's Corner, where each week on Thursday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, we have college coaches across all levels and in, in divisions that take a few minutes to join us to talk baseball, a little bit about youth baseball, a little bit about high school, and obviously college baseball. My name is Walter Beatty, and I am joined this evening uh, by a 20, is it the 23rd year this year, yeah. Mike? Yeah, 20, 23 year head coach at Ole Miss, Mike Bianco. Mike, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My pleasure, Walter. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I, uh, I really look forward to this. This is going to be special. And I want to take a few moments because, you know, while doing a little due diligence, I noticed that you are. Hall of Fame high school player, Hall of Fame junior college player, soon to be, or I'm sure you'll be a, a Hall of Fame college coach. I want to start by you as a player, because it's very intriguing to me about Mike Bianco, the player, and you having gone the JUCO route uh, and ultimately ending up at LSU. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey as a youth player? from high school into junior college, and then ultimately the SEC? Sure. You know, I uh, you know, I grew up in South Florida in a city called Seminole, uh, which is a suburb of St. Petersburg, kind of nestled between Clearwater and St. Pete, you know, the Tampa Bay area. Uh, but uh, a lot of people don't know this about me, Walter, so I guess it's it's going to be out after tonight. But, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't born in Florida. I was born in Wilmington, Delaware right outside of Philadelphia, so I'm a Yankee. So, but when you're the head coach of the Rebels, you kind of keep that on the down low, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I, I share that because growing up in South Florida, uh, I really wasn't tied to, you know, I was a Florida fan or Florida State. I, I guess growing up, I just watched and followed whoever, you know, was good at the time, which most, most of the time, all three were good, right? Florida, Florida State, Miami, along with other schools. But when it came time to, to make a decision at a high school on where to go to school, I really wasn't getting recruited by anybody that really interests me. And so uh, the junior college system, as it is today, still in Florida was very strong. And so I decided to go to junior college to a place called the Indian River Community College. And uh, I played there for two years. And really, uh, I thought I was going to end up at Florida State or Miami. I was getting recruited. And then all of a sudden, they kind of turned directions and started recruiting high school catchers. And, and, and I really didn't have a place to land. I, you know, I had some you know, places that were recruiting me, but nobody that really interests me. And then, uh, lo and behold, I, I got a call from Louisiana State University. And, uh, and uh, to be honest with you, I didn't even know where Louisiana was. I knew it was over there near Texas somewhere, but I never left the state of Florida. And, uh, uh, but I did know of their coach. You know, they had a guy coaching there that just got there a few years previous, uh, a guy by the name of Skip Bergman. And the new of Coach Bergman, because he was uh, an assistant at the University of Miami, when they won their first national championship in 1982 and then in 1984, he went to LSU. So I knew they had, you know, this great coach in Skip Bertman and they were in the SEC. And so basically that was about as good as I could get it at that time. And, and so, um, uh, went there on a visit and, uh, uh, fell in love, you know, with the campus, but probably more importantly, fell in love with the program, fell in love with coach Bertman and, and so this was way before, you know, the dynasty started. It uh, really was the fall of 1986. So it was just a couple months removed uh, from their first College World Series appearance. And so went there on a visit, uh, committed, and, you know, ended up playing there in 1988 and 89 as a junior college transfer. Well, what I think is really interesting, and one of the points that I wanted to make, there's a correlation between Skip Bertman, the motivator, Mike Bianco, the motivator, and I'm sure Skip had a lot to do with that. But I want to, you mentioned Miami, Ron Frazier. We could, we could probably put a Mount Rushmore of coaches between Ron Frazier, uh, you know, Coach Stevenson at, at Wichita State, Coach Dado out at USC. But one could argue that Skip Bertman might be that biggest, you know, monument on, on, the, on the wall, so to speak. And you played for Skip Bertman in an era when college baseball was just beginning to kind of grow itself into what it's ultimately become, largely due to the promotional dynamics of Ron Frazier, but more importantly, the attitude and the energy from LSU. So can you talk a little bit about the SEC as a baseball conference from you as a player and it's kind of its early 
heyday as it was growing into what it is now, which is ultimately one of, if not the best baseball conference in the country. Yeah, you know, um, there's been a lot of great coaches. And when you talk about that era with Ron Frazier, when, when Coach Bourbon was one of his assistants, of course, Ron Polk was one of his assistants. Right. And so Barry Weinstein, well, Weinstein, right? So, you know, uh, when you start to talk about these legends, you know, that, that were, were under, you know, uh, Ron Frazier at the time. And I don't want to speak for Coach Bourbon, but the, the way that I understand it, when he went to work for, for, for Frazier in Miami, you know, he was more the tactician. You know, he was more the X's and O's. He was the pitching coach that came in and had a system. Frazier was more the marketer. He was the guy that went out and raised the money, got people into the stadium. You know, Mark Light Stadium, you know, you'd watch on Sunday night at ESPN where they were looking for things to, you know, put, you know, on, on the air back in the early 80s before they had a major league contract and all these other things. They did a lot of games of the week for college baseball on Sunday nights before they got that Sunday night major league deal, right? And you always saw either Arizona State, Texas, or Miami, it seemed like, every Sunday night. And that was because of what Ron Frazier did. So when Coach Bourbon got to, to LSU, he learned a lot of that, I think, marketing from, from Frazier and, and, and knew how to, to build it, you know, how to put people into the stadium where he had to give the speeches and go around to the Rotary Clubs and the Qantas Clubs and, you know, how to you know, market the program and, and get people into the stadium. Uh, but also he was the, you know, the tactician, right? He was the guy that, you know, could, you know, was a great pitching coach. And, you know, we still do things today that we, the same bunt defenses that we ran in 88, 89, we're running, you know, in the national championship game, you know, just a few months ago. And so uh, he, he, he learned and was mentored by some great coaches. And then I think he was just the culmination of all of that. And, and he changed college baseball, you know, they, uh, LSU, you know, uh, people look at it today and, and look at the, you know, the success that they have. But, but the truth of the matter, you know, it all goes back to, of course, his days where in the 90s, he won five national championships in 10 years. I mean, think about that for a second, five national championships in 10 years. And, and when you look at wins and losses, he's, he's second on the SEC uh, in the most wins. Uh, but why you don't see him in some of those you know, with uh, with uh, Augie Garrido and some of those other, he only coached for eighteen years. I mean, he was a head coach for. Uh, you just said I'm twenty three at McNeese. I mean, right. A year at Ole Miss and three at McNeese. I'm at twenty six. I'm right. already eight me eight years longer than Coach Burtman coached. You know, an entire career, and so he, you know, he retired relatively early. I want to say in his early sixties, but he didn't get the job at LSU. I think until he was like forty six years old, something like that. Uh, then retired and became the athletic director for maybe eight years or so. So, uh, but he was one of a kind and really changed college baseball. You know, there's been a lot of great ones, of course, Polk and Augie Garrido, and you said Rod Dato and Gene Stevenson and Ron Frazier. And they're, yeah, they're, I mean, uh, the Mount Rushmore would have a lot of faces, but the top one would be Skip Berman. You know, without a doubt, I don't think you get too many arguments from that. So the evolution of college baseball, which I call now the golden carrot that gets put out in front of young players and parents and families and, and, and you know, the allure of playing college baseball. And I, I, you know, I love your story as far as high school player, maybe not recruited to the degree that you were. And now we're going into junior college, junior college leading to that four year school. We've kind of come back to where junior college is now really, you know, kind of a standing out in the eyes of parents they met may never have considered junior college before. Can you talk about from a recruiting standpoint? I don't want to go down the portal road right now. I'm talking about the high school athlete and the value that may be uh, that allows a, a student to go to a junior college and then be prepared to play in an environment such as at Ole Miss. Well, you know, I think everybody's recruiting story is different. Everybody's past different. You know, we, we play in a sport where um, skill matters, obviously, and development matters. But all of that happens for different for, for kids at different times and the different, you know, kids grow at different times. I, I wasn't a very big guy, as you know. So, you know, when when I was a freshman, uh, not that, you know, it was a different era, but, you know, I don't know if anybody knew that I would end up playing college baseball because I wasn't real big. And so, you know, I, I really think, you know, parents have to 
step back and take a deep breath and and, and realize that uh, just because your son maybe not maybe he's not getting the attention as you know some other kids on his travel team in ninth and tenth grade that doesn't mean that he's not going to find his spot you know eventually you know at a power five school uh, but everybody's kind of kind of you know got to find their own path and I think give it time to 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 happen for them you know not to panic. You know, people ask me all the time is uh, I, I, I think the line that I use a lot is, you know, don't 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 hear the clock ticking, you know, because you're right. You know, I think sometimes people go, well, you know, uh, I don't want to go to junior college. I want to play in the SEC or I want to play in the Big 12 or the ACC or what have you. And that's terrific. And it's not that you shouldn't have those goals, uh, but that may not happen as a freshman. Maybe you have to go to a junior college for a year or two. Uh, and let's face it, it may never happen. You know, right. Uh, you know, and, and that's OK, too. Uh, you know, and uh, but 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 at the end of the day, everybody's got to find the right fit for them. And I, I think a lot of times uh, because you, you're you're watching what other people are doing, you know, uh, you you're comparing yourself to so many other people that your path may not be the same. But at the end of the day, you may end up getting to where they're getting. You just may get there a different way. Well, I always, going back to when I was coaching and when Tyler and Kyle were very little, I used to always tell parents, be careful of the rabbit you're chasing today. It may not be the rabbit you wanted to chase. Right. You have to run your own race. And so one of the questions that's come in from a multitude of parents, they want to know how you feel about these student athletes that commit at these young ages of eighth and ninth grade and a follow-up do you think or do you foresee a rule change that would kind of go on par with softball and lacrosse as far as only allowing commitments in say the fall of your junior year as a student athlete all right so you asked two questions that seem very similar uh but they're really you know two different subjects right uh, so let's let's take it from the first question, the, the parent question of how do you feel about a kid, you know, committing, you know, early, let's say ninth or tenth grader, right? Um, wh what I say, and I say it to kids that we're recruiting, right, is if you found the right place for you, if that's that's the right place for you, and you're sure, I don't see any reason to keep kicking the can down the road because I don't think the recruiting process is really a fun, pleasant thing. You know, the recruiting process is nice if you end up in the destination that you want to be. But to, to, to get recruited and to get phone calls after a while, I think that becomes cumbersome, you know, especially if you're a kid that's being highly recruited and you are 14 years old or 15. Right. You know, uh, I think that 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 takes away from a lot of things. And so don't feel pressured into that. You have to commit in ninth or 10th grade or you're not going to find your spot. But if you're a kid in Mississippi and your parents went to Ole Miss and you wanted to go to Ole Miss and they recruited you and you're, you're in ninth, I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, you know, one of the things our philosophy is, you know, we're not going to recruit a lot of kids that are that young unless we're positive, right? And that's why when you look at our recruiting classes, we don't have 20 kids in the ninth grade just because we don't think we're that good to figure out that many guys that can play <laughs> at our level at that age. But if we do find the kid, and it is a right fit. I don't see that there's anything wrong with that. Now, the other part of the, the, the question or the second question that you asked, um, I think is complicated. And I think if you ask 10 coaches, you get 10 different opinions. I get the we want to slow it down. I don't think you can. See, I'm of the opinion that you won't. I think people are going to circumvent the rule without cheating necessarily. I don't want to say that because cheaters are always going to cheat, right? So you, you can't stop that. But people will find ways to circumvent, to go around the rules, and so on. And so you can try to push it back. Um, I may go the other way. I may say, why don't you open it up? Why don't you not worry at what time you can call or do any of that? Because I think eventually it goes full circle. So if you let's look at the football model, right? So right now, usually in baseball, if a kid commits in baseball, he's going to end up going to that school, right? right. If he commits Ole Miss or commits to Vanderbilt, Right. Usually those commitments are pretty, pretty solid. Right. Uh, and they're not going to go somewhere else. Well, that's starting to change a little bit. And that's unfortunate. Right. And there's a lot of reasons why. But that's a little unfortunate. But if at the end of the day, if a kid wasn't really committed until his senior year, until he signed the, the paper like it is in football. Right. Guess what? 
you wouldn't be so enamored to go after the ninth grader because at the end of the day, it's not going to really matter until his senior year. And I think it would probably help out everybody. But if you found the right freshman, like football does, right, the running back from Oxford High School that wants to come to Ole Miss and it's a perfect fit or whatever, he may commit. That may be as a solid as commitment as there can be. But, but at the end of the day, you're starting to get baseball players right, that are having the hats out and having their thing and putting it on. And when, when that starts to happen, you know, to me is, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm not sure trying to slow it down is really going to slow it down. You know, I think it's just people are going to find a way to get around it. The parents, there's a lot of parents out there that, that are going to figure out a way. Uh, they did it through COVID, right? Right. You know, or, you know, kids kept going through school. Kids couldn't visit, could, you know, but you were doing Zooms and you were doing and Kids kept committing. And so the, the, the kids that want to commit and the people that want to recruit kids early, I think that's going to continue to happen. And I don't think, you know, any legislation necessarily is going to be able to slow that down. Because whenever you put that date, you're going to have the kid committing on that date, right? Right. right. You know, like, you know, how, how, how by 9 o'clock on August 1 did the kid commit? He wasn't supposed to talk to anybody. He wasn't supposed to. How did that happen? You know, like, so who are we fooling ourselves? Why are we, why are we going to try to go down that, 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 that road? You know, to me, at the end of the day, that, and again, one man's opinion. He has 10 coaches, you're going to get 10 different opinions. But at the end of the day, you know, to me, you know, uh, the parents have to control a lot of that. If they don't want their kid recruited, you know, at that age, guess what? Don't let your, your kid talk to the coaches. Tell the coaches, hey, we appreciate it. We'll talk to you when we're, we're 17. You know, but guess what? That's not really happening. That's true. Now, I want you to put your dad hat on. I know you're a father of five, correct? Correct. Okay, so now, how do you feel about this whole? You had a son that played at LSU, played against you, went to a World Series uh, against you. How, how do you feel about the the model of youth baseball with regard to the all year round component? I'm not referring to strength training. I'm referring more towards tournaments and showcases and uh, just seasons that tend to go from January all the way into November and December. You know. I- I, I think it's it's easy to tr- want to believe that, hey, you're going to be a better baseball player if you just train year-round. Um, I don't necessarily know if there's there's any information that proves that out. You know, when a, when a kid's 12, 13, 14 years old, that if he doesn't play football, if he doesn't play basketball or some other sport, that he just focuses on baseball, he's going to be a better baseball player. It seems to make sense, but, you know, when we look back at some of the best players that we've ever had, you know, that Jacob Gonzalez was a high school quarterback, you know, like uh, Calvin Harris, who's like the 50th ranked player in the country, catcher of ours, you know, was a high school, you know, quarterback and running back. You know, uh, my son Drew that, that played at LSU and is at Houston now, uh, you know, he played football his first two years, uh, got hurt, hurt his neck and couldn't play football anymore. So then he picked up the basketball and started playing basketball. Okay. And so, you know, I, you know, I'm not a component of that. Uh, now, if you're not going to play anything else, then, yeah, you might as well train for baseball or strength train or do something that's going to help you. I'm, I don't think you need to go play, you know, uh, you know, video games, you know, in the offseason. That's certainly not going to help you. Uh, but but I, I don't think, you know, playing, you know, year round necessarily, especially for young people. And I think that's one of the reasons that there are as many arm injuries as they are, because you have these kids at a younger age that are playing tournaments every single weekend they're, and they're, they're pitching multiple days and, uh, and they're doing it at eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old. And so, and they're bigger and they're stronger and they're training and, and all these things. And it's just the perfect storm. You got kids that are bigger, stronger, that are throwing harder and are throwing more at a younger age. And the body just wasn't built to sustain that. And I think that's why, you know, not just pitchers, but you got other positions that are, right. you know, hurting themselves um and and here's another thing that people don't talk about um when you talk about playing multiple sports um i i really liked it i loved it as a parent i loved it as a parent that i got to go in a gym and they played a sport that had a clock and it was going to be 68 degrees in the gym that that was fun for me as a parent you know uh, to be able to see that but the other part and and i joke was for my son to play on teams uh, that had a different demographic on the team than, 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 than we saw in baseball, that he could hang around and become friends with a whole different group of kids. 
And uh, I thought that was great. I thought that was uh, a, a, a neat thing for him growing up uh, to play football and basketball and be, be around a lot of different kids versus the same, you know, 15, 18 kids that he's been playing with. Now, those are great families. But I thought, again, to be around some different kids, you know, from different backgrounds, I thought was 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 a neat thing. And, and it wasn't the the uh, I think the motivation to do it. But it was one of the end results that when we, Cammy and I, when we look back at it, you know, we're neat that, that you know, we got, we got to make some different friends and be around different people and go to a high school football game on a Friday night. There's, there's not, a, there's not many thing, cooler things than to go to a football game on a Friday night in your, in your town or, you know, to go to a you know, state basketball tournament. Those, those are pretty cool things. And I think if a kid's, you know, good enough to, to play those sports and wants to, he should. Well, especially in a state like Louisiana, I mean, I had the fortune of living in Louisiana for six years, being around high schools like Jesuit and uh, John Curtis and obviously Catholic, watching them play Coach Bass, uh, you know, when they would come down to Nolens and, you know, the, the environment there, you know, whether it's football or basketball, it's, it's the crowd is into it. It's jam packed. It's really it's really fun. And one of the things that you touched on there, I'm going to kind of slide a quick question in. You know, baseball is is really at the major league level. You know, you have a really diverse – the diversity problem is is getting worse, meaning you have a lot of Latin players getting into the game, almost 30%, whereas the African-American uh, aspect of, of the game with regard to major league 40-man rosters, I think it's below 10 now. I think it's about 9%. How do we infuse and get more uh, – you know, kids involved with baseball. I don't want to go down the NIL name, image, and likeness, but I, how do we get more young athletes enthusiastic and excited about the sport of baseball? Man, that's a great question. And there's people working on it, as you know, Walter. You know, we right. discuss it a lot. You know, at the NCA level, they talk so much about it. You know, at the major league level, and they've they've done some grassroots things in, in inner cities to to try to promote baseball. Um, I don't have that answer. I wish I did. You know, I think, uh, you know, they're working on it. Uh, I'm not smart enough, you know, but, but some of the, pro, you know, the, I think the obvious issues that we have is the model to get to college baseball uh, seems to be through travel baseball. Right. And, and unfortunately, uh, it's, it's, it's similar in a way how AAU basketball was in the 80s and the 90s, and maybe still is today. I don't know enough about it. But the difference is that was um, uh, afforded to these kids by sponsorships, right? right? By Nike and Adidas and these shoe companies provided opportunities for the best basketball players to be in these tournaments. And, and I, all above board, not nothing illegal. I'm not saying right, that. Right. I'm trying to go down that road. I'm just saying now, like it's always happened for baseball, right? Baseball just wears it, right? At the end of the day, you can't say it. Anybody, you know, the high school baseball coach, man, he's, he's cutting his grass. He's painting his dugout. He's doing all of that. Right. Uh, college baseball coaches are doing that. We right. did that in East State. We cut the grass and painted the dugout. I did that, right? Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, baseball has always worn it. And so when we used kind of that model, that travel baseball kind of AAU, you know, we're going to get the best players and we're going to put them in one city and it's going to be in Atlanta and we're going to do all of this. That's awesome. But it's the parents that are flipping the bill. Right. And it's costing them thousands of dollars. Now, if you ask Mike Bianco in your 30 years you know, of coaching, what's made the biggest difference in college baseball? I'd shock you by saying travel baseball. It's been it's made the biggest positive impact on college baseball. I think it's one of the reasons that we have so much parity. I think there's one of the reasons that the players are so good. I said they're playing against great competition. Why you know it's amazing. Everybody talks about how hard people throw now. What what amazes me is how people can hit that. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. One thing to say you got some young kid that's throwing 95. What's amazing is you got some kid that's hitting that 95. And so, you know, uh, travel baseball's done that. The unfortunate thing is, you know, it costs you several thousand dollars when you're eight years old to play baseball. And that's part of the problem, you know, with the, you know, I think in the inner cities where the kids can't afford to do that. 
And so that's, you know, I think that's a, that's a tough thing for us. Then you talk about from the college standpoint, you know, the, the lack of, you know, minorities and I, I you know, obviously the 11.7 scholarships. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, college baseball would still exist with six scholarships. The NCAA came in and said, Hey, listen, that's it. I know you guys want more scholarships, but guess what? We're taking 5.7 away and you're only going to have six scholarships. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go coach my team tomorrow. Right. You know, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, you right. know, that stinks, but I'm going to go coach my team tomorrow. You know, if you said, Hey, you don't have a grounds crew. Well, guess what? We're going to take the lawnmower and we're going to go cut grass tomorrow. You right. mean that we just keep rolling. And so at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, it would be nice to have 23 full scholarships. And I think that would open up some opportunities, um, you know, for, for some for some minorities and some kids and in, in, in inner city kids. But um, it, it's, it's tough now. And, uh, you know, kind of at the mercy. I think for the first time in my 30 years, I do feel that it is on the horizon, that we will Good. get more relief when that will happen and what that will look like. I don't know. But I think that scholarship piece, um, I think uh, you, you, we're, we're going we're gonna to make some headway soon. So, so the big part of the travel ball world that, that a lot of parents and student athletes get consumed with, and I want to ask you as a college coach, when do analytics slash metrics begin to matter to you? Because a lot of parents of 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, they talk about velocity, they talk exit velocity, you know, they talk about swing speed. Instead of worrying about skill set development, we're, we're chasing numbers. When do you begin to notice a student athlete's metrics? Uh, that's a great question. And probably not until, you know, high school. But all of this is is kind of like a lot of things in society, right? It's just moving at, at warp speed and it's hard to catch up. But just a few years ago, we didn't really even know what, what all of that meant, right? You know, you see it on ESPN, but what did it mean to, to Mike Bianco and Ole Miss? Like, you know, we had a track man you know, set up in our stadiums for so many years before we even knew we were inputting the information for Major League Baseball, but we weren't using the information. You know, they were using it to, to, to draft kids and evaluate kids. But, you know, it took us a while to kind of grasp just how to gather the data to use it, not to necessarily evaluate where that's where it was first became valuable for Major League Baseball. Right. Is how instead of saying he's got a Clayton Kershaw curveball, does it is it really a Clayton Kershaw curveball? Right. Does it spin like does it spin as fast, same axis, the same break? up out of hand, all these analytics that you could, you, you could, you could actually objectively look at it. Is it the same versus, you know, just the, the eye test. Right. And so they would use it as an evaluation tool, either in the draft or in trades, but they didn't use it as a development tool immediately. And that's one of the reasons that they're starting to hire college baseball coaches to be their pitching coaches right. because they didn't know how to use it as a development tool. They only use, knew how to use it objectively to compare who had a good fastball and we want that guy. We know that he throws 95, but his 95 is better, right? It, it does this. It, it has some vertical you know, break to it, and it, it's going to play up a little more. And so we, over the years, have learned, I think college coaches, and especially in my program, have spent a lot of time how to use this data to improve the guys. Because it's we don't get as much, we're getting more now, but a couple of years ago, we got like nothing. Like, you know, we, we weren't getting anything from perfect game or, you, you know, you didn't, that, that, that data from a 16 year old kid wasn't, we didn't have, it, you know, wasn't, we didn't have access to that. But now you're starting to have radar guns that have spin rate on them. And, and so, again, I, I go back to that, you know, uh, you know, our lives, like a lot of things in our life, you know, it's going at warp speed and we're just trying to catch up with it. So the, 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 the short answer, that was a long answer. The short answer is, you know, in high school, not, not certainly that some, ten, you know, 10-year-old kid. And I think that's one of, we talked about it today, today in our office, one of the issues of where we are in baseball. And, you know, you and I are similar ages, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, you know, when the AstroTurf became more prevalent in the symmetrical ballparks and it was about speed, and it was about defense and about bunning, right? Bunning. Then you 
the 90s and it was the steroid era and the ballparks changed, right? Then all of a sudden, the, you know, the different ballparks and they were built smaller and the ball traveled more and that people loved the home runs, right? And now we're in another era where it, it seems like it's, it's more stuff over fundamentals and skill, right? So it's more Bingo. velocity. And, and so you see a lot more strikeouts, but you see a lot more walks. You see you know, a lot more home runs, right? And you see a lot more strikeouts. The game's played differently. It's not anybody's necessarily fault. It's just where we are. You know, will it change? Sure, it will. It's going to change in 15 years. But I don't know where it's going to go. But, but, but I've watched it over my lifetime change. And, you know, right now I think we're caught up into those things where guys, you know, it's – remember when it was impressive that a guy threw 90? Exactly. Now it's exactly. impressive when he doesn't throw 90, right? right? Like exactly. Ben McDonald threw 90, and he was like one of the few. Russell right. Spring, a couple right. guys. You know, now everybody throws 90. Well, now I want – you just mentioned the name, and, I, and, I, and it, was, it ties in with my next question. A lot of times parents and student athletes, both, I'm a parent and, and I, you know, you get caught up in it. We start thinking about pro baseball. We look at college as kind of like, oh, I go to the SEC, I'm going to be a big leaguer, I'm going to play professional baseball. But when we step back, it's about those moments, those memories, those relationships. You as a coach with that group of student athletes, the student athletes with each other, those boys go on to be members of each other's weddings. They have reunions. They come back. Uh, so can you talk, and, and you had arguably one of the greatest group of, you know, uh, characters and teammates when you were at LSU. And one of them was was Ben, Big Ben McDonald, sure. who I call the, the character of college baseball. I mean, I could listen to that guy call an ant race. Uh, and I just find him to be heartfelt, direct, candid, but he talks so glowingly about his days as a player at LSU and you were his battery mate. Can you talk about your relationships and how you kind of really foster that environment now as a coach with regard to it? There's more to this than just successes and obviously winning the world series, but it's those relationships that ultimately matter. Well, well, that's it. You know, you know, we're so fortunate in college and the reason it's a little different than in high school, because in high school, they, they, they grew up together and, and they have those relationships with those kids. But the kids that are fortunate enough to, to go on and play, you know, in college baseball, one of the unique things is that age that they're at, right? 18, right. 20 years old, and they're away from home for the first time in their lives. So they're they're learning, they're growing, they're starting to, you know, become an, a young adult and become the person that they are with you know 38 other kids on their team right and so you're living and it's not like you're just buddies with these guys you live with them right right? and you travel with them and you practice with them and you're on a bus and and all these and that's why you know we say it and it's true and you've seen it with your children as well that when they if they're fortunate not enough to get married at one day a lot of their friends in that wedding are going to be the guys they went to college with those are the guys that they have the, the, the lasting relationships with. And, and here's something that people don't talk about, right? So a lot of things, what I just said, I think a lot of people know and get and understand. But here's the difference. One of the differences, a big difference. In pro baseball, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, it's great, and some people are going to get that opportunity. But here's really one of the differences that I think goes to your question. When Ben McDonald was playing, when I was playing college baseball, right, all we wanted to do was win. I wanted to get hits and he wanted to strike people out and he wanted to have success. But at the end of the day, it mattered more that we won, right? That is the last time that you can really be, that could be your number one concern, right? When you're in high school, is it more important? I said this to a recruit last night. Is it more important that you get two hits, you know, against your arch rival? Or is it more and, 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 and lose or go over for four and win? And he said quickly, no, just win. I'll get my hits tomorrow. When you're a pro, you can't think like that ever, even when you're in the big leagues, because at the end of the day, right, how well you do allows you to keep playing the game. Nobody. How about this? I've been a coach for 30 years. I don't know how many professional baseball players. I've never once asked any of my kids that have gone on the pro baseball when I've talked to them, hey, how many games out of first are you? You know, how are you guys going to make the Florida State playoffs this year? I've never asked them how their team was doing. I've only asked them. And guess what? The Yankees, the Mets, they don't care how that team's doing either. 
All they care about is how Tyler Beatty's doing, how their prospects are doing, right? right. That's all they really care about because that's that's it. And so you watch kids, and, it, and, and it's the business part of it. It doesn't mean that it's awful. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't play it. I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't mean it that way, but it's different. For the first time in your life, you're going to play the game for you. Now, you want to win, but it's secondary. At the end of the day, it's more important that you get the hits because if you don't get the hits, you won't be with them next week. Right. Here, you know, and, you know, it's different, and people don't look at it that way. But it's really true, and I think that's one of the things that when Ben McDonald and other guys, there, there's not a Lance Lynn, Kozar, guys that have made millions. Lance Lynn, $100 million in the major leagues. The best time that he's ever had was playing college baseball. You know, those, those kids say it all the time. And, again, it doesn't mean that major league baseball, making that money and, and doing that's not really cool and a great job. Yeah, probably better than selling insurance, right, or, you know, doing something else. But at the end of the day, when you talk about a time in your life and how enjoyable, right, man, if you could freeze those four years that you're in college baseball, we'd all we we groundhog day. We could just keep doing that the rest of our oh, life. Pretty amen. Cool. All the time, I would do that. Now, my last question ties into all of this, and I, I I know I can ask you this question because I know that you, when you were coaching Tyler, you understood the the word expectation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, parents and student athletes, they think of it when they're young, but then as they get into high school, it becomes this heavy, heavy weight. Mm -hmm. The expectation of A, making your parents happy, B, your team happy, and you, you feel like results are the only things that matter. Mm -hmm. And you lose sight of that being competitive and role within the team. Can you just kind of close out with, getting parents and student athletes to understand don't get so bogged down in the weight of expectation, compete and understand and learn how to excel in your role as part of a team. Right. And, and, and parents may not want to hear this, but you know, I'm a parent of four boys that played college baseball. So, so I'm, I'm lumping myself in with the parents. So, you know, so parents don't get, get upset, but you know, the, the that's the biggest problem. It's not so much the kid, it's it's the, the, the parents, it's the expectation. But in, in defense for the parents, it's not that you know they they want their kid to make millions of dollars so they can retire early. That that's not it. They're just trying to be good parents, right? Right. And so there's an expectation. Sometimes people do that with grades, right? That they put so much pressure on the kid to to to, to, to do so well in school so he'll get into the right college and become a doctor and do all these things. And, and so it's not just with sports, but we, we're in sports and we see it, see it all the time. And it's a shame because at the end of the day, baseball ends for all of us at some point, right? At, at some point, it's going to stop. It may, it may stop in high school. It may stop in college. Or it may stop in professional baseball. But at the end of the day, it stops for all of us, right? Tom Brady's going to stop playing football someday. Now, who knows when that's going to be, but he's going to stop, right? And, you know, you know, at the end of the day, you got to you gotta enjoy it. And one of the things that I think I struggle with as a coach, and I say this a lot to our incoming freshmen, is, you know, you need to learn how to be able to play the game like you played it in high school, right? Because a lot of the kids that are at our level, they were stars in high school and stars on their travel team, and then they walk into the locker room at Ole Miss, or Vanderbilt or LSU or where have what have you. And for the first time, they're they they know they're not the best player in that locker room or the best pitcher on the staff. And that can be really intimidating and it can really stump their growth as a player, right? Uh, to where all of a sudden they're throwing it differently, right? They're swinging differently. And you know, for the first time in their life, they're worried about making the team or keeping not getting cut or you know, keeping their scholarship or you know, red shirt and all these different things. And to go along with what you said, the expectations, but if they could just play like they played with, you know, the, 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 the enjoyment and just trying to play and be the best that you can and let the, you know, let, you know, uh, uh, happen, you know, happen. And, uh, uh, but, but it's a tough thing. It's tough. And, you know, so I think parents could help out a lot uh, and, and not, I can't tell you to forget about it, but I can, like, we try to tell our players, you know, check your body language sometimes and just take a deep breath. And when you want to say something, don't, you know, and, and, and just smile and try to, 
you know, at the end of the game, just tell your kid, hey, nice job. I love you. You know, uh, that would help a lot, you know, versus trying to dissect the game and how you can get better. Guess what? You know, if they're a pretty good player and they play in a pretty good program and you're paying all this money for them to play travel baseball and lessons and all that, they're getting enough of that already. They don't need when they just got done good or bad for you to dissect it for them. You know, they're, they're already doing that. It'd probably be refreshing for them to say, hey, thanks. You know, thanks for telling me that. And let's go get an ice cream cone. That may do more for their, you know, at, you know, uh, at bats for next game or the next bullpen session than anything that you can dissect as a parent driving home, you know, in, in the car. And, and again, I know it's hard. I, you know, I struggle with it and I do it for a living. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not the, you know, I'm not the teacher or the doctor that's trying to, I'm the college coach, you know? And so it's hard for me to bite my lip and just say, it's okay. You know, Hey man, tough one. You know, you're going to be, you'll be fine. Forget about it. Let's go get you know, ice cream cone, you know? Uh, but we need to do more of that. I know I struggle with that when I was coaching and the boys went from the little league ages into the travel realm at 14 and 15, ultimately high school. I had a difficult time not, being a coach and you know one of the best things Corb's ever said to me is listen you can be a dad you can be a coach but you can't be both at the same time and you know don't be coach uh with with the boys so you know mike i i want to say thank you for giving so much of your time i also want to encourage parents whether you find mike uh on social media twitter uh, facebook what have you and he's giving a motivational speech stop whatever you're doing and take a listen i actually had a librarian from austin texas go out of her way to send me a text to tell me that your speech on failure prior to i assume one of the uh, the final world series game in in omaha she said she recorded it and she saved it for her grandson so i want you to know that you know you have a life as a motivational speaker on that tedx tour or whatever they call that stuff you can do that after you're done coaching well, thank you, Walter. Yeah, but I learned from the best, as you know, we, we said before we got on here. You know, I uh, uh, I, I, I got it all from from the great Skip Burton. Well, whoever does your uh, your media work and gets inside your pregame and postgame huddles, you got to give them uh, some kudos because they capture some gold. And whenever it makes its way to social media, I always find my way to it. But my kudos and congratulations. I know that College World Series meant so much to you your wife, your family, obviously the university. Congratulations. It was a wonderful moment. I enjoyed every moment from the regionals through and into the, the College World Series because I know how, how much that meant to you. So congratulations. Tyler said to say congratulations. He's actually texting me, telling me that you look uh, movie star-esque these days. He said, keep, keep, the, keep the specs, he said. He said, keep the specs. So well, I want to say. Well, I'm pulling for him, and uh, you know, you know what a what a great kid, and was a pleasure to have and, and coach him, you know, on the 2013 uh, USA national team. So I appreciate you having me, and uh, you know, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Super, thank you, Mike, very much. And for parents, if you liked this discussion with Coach Bianco, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. We'd love for you to subscribe to the channel. Uh, this is a platform for both parents and student athletes. So make sure you leave your comments and your questions. Next week, we're going to have Coach King, Jason King, from Dayton University, a lifelong friend. I've known him forever. And he's going to join us next Thursday evening at 9 p.m. Eastern time. So, Mike, have a great upcoming season. Hopefully see you at the, I believe you're playing the Commodores opening SEC weekend. And I will be there for that. And awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll have to wear one of these one day. So yeah, I'll, you may get some help, <laughs> help from Corbs, but go ahead. I want to see that. I want to see All right. Day. All right. That's a challenge. But, Mike, good luck and thank you to everybody and have a great night. And we're looking forward to next week. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Walter. Bye now.